事。Remember, he's not a suspect yet, so we question him, not damage him. Okay? Oh, sure, yeah. Okay, I won't hurt. Look, I'll let you do all the talking. Let me do all the talking. Remember that. Let me do all okay, the talking. Experience counts here. Yeah. You're not gonna smoke in the car. Well, I am. <laughs> Does this bother you? I mean, I'll put it out if it bothers you. Yeah, it bothers me. Does it? Yeah. The jumper's name is Amanda Hunsucker. Age 22. What, what was the name? Hunsucker. Yeah, yeah, the parents. Oh, parents. Michael and Claire. Claire. You know them. Got some news on the Hunsucker case, Raj. That was quick. So was the autopsy. They're not calling it a suicide. B is, I'm supposed to tell you, you're breaking in a new partner in on this. Partner again? Yeah, some cat he's on loan from dope. Real burnout on the ragged edge. Oh, perfect. Raj, meet your new partner. You're making a mistake by keeping him in the field, okay? The man is suicidal. Now, we both know why I was transferred. You want to see crazy? I'll tell you. Don't you touch me! Everybody thinks I'm suicidal, in which case I'm fucked and nobody wants to work with me. The autopsy report showed that Amanda was poisoned. Even if she hadn't jumped, she'd still be dead. Wait, wait, Raj, Raj. Come on, you find him, you find him, and you killed him. You can do that. You owe me. Hey, what did he mean when he said you owed him? Uh, we served together in 1965, uh, the Drang Valley. It saved my life. Part of the device. Oh, this is artwork. This is goddamn artwork. Well, I'm glad you like it. No, you don't get it. This is real pro stuff. I haven't seen anything like this since the war. A couple of years ago, Shadow Company got together again. The war was over, but we still had our list of sources in Asia. And? And we've been bringing it in ever since. Bringing in what? Heroin. I'm gonna burn it down. Are you really crazy? Or are you as good as you say you are? You're gonna have to trust me. <laughs> What day is it? Not damn Christmas, Finger! The 6th of March in 1987, Lethal Weapon exploded onto the big screen in the USA and landed in the UK on the 28th of August. Directed by Richard Donner, at the time most famous for his directing duties on The Omen, Superman and The Goonies, the film proved very successful at the box office, bringing in $65 million domestically on a $15 million budget and grossed a total of $120 million worldwide. The film received praise from critics such as Siskel and Ebert, both awarding it the thumbs up. The Washington Post said it reminded them how exciting an action film can be, and the New York Times said it packed an undeniable wallop. Lethal Weapon refined the buddy cop movie that went back to 48 hours and the year before with Running Scared. The film's success on the big screen and VHS spawned three successful sequels, and more recently a spin-off TV show was produced lasting three seasons, but the best thing to come out of Lethal Weapon's success was the fantastic spoof Loaded Weapon 1, which I recommend everyone watch. The screenplay for the film was written by then unknown writer Shane Black, who was only 25 years old and just came out of UCLA. Inspired by the idea of writing an urban western, he took ideas on the hard-boiled cop novels he read growing up and the Dirty Harry movies of the 70s. Black's original screenplay took on a darker direction and was bigger in scope. With helicopters crashing in the streets, the Hollywood sign was in flames, a tanker truck full of cocaine explodes on the Hollywood hills, raining down cocaine for the movie's climax. His approach to writing the script was taking two styles and putting them together, first with William Goldman who was a mentor Shane's and the punchy rough style of Walter Hill. 
His agent sent the Lethal Weapon script to various studios such as Paramount and Columbia, and they all rejected it until it came to Warner Brothers. The executive of the studio, Mark Canton, took a liking to it and purchased it for $250,000. Canton brought it along to producer Joel Silver, who loved the story and worked with Shane to further develop the script, bouncing ideas back and forth to further refine it. They ended up reducing the scale of the third act and throwing in more characters. The studio offered it to a bunch of big-name directors till it landed on Richard Donner's lap. He at that point had been offered a number of action films thanks to his efforts on Superman, and many he read didn't interest him, but Lethal Weapon was all about the characters which really excited him. <laughs> Director Richard Donner did feel the script was too dark and brought in writer Jeffrey Boehm to do some uncredited rewrites on Black's script. Jeffrey and Richard added more humour into the script to lighten it up. With these key elements in place, the search began for the right combination of actors to play Riggs and Murtar. When they started to look for an actor to fill the role of Riggs, Bruce Willis was considered for the part, and even Christopher Reeve, who turned it down. It would have been great to see Donna and Reeve work together again, but it would have been such a different performance with Chris in the title role. Richard Donner really wanted Mel Gibson for the part of Martin Riggs. He had previously offered him a part in Ladyhawk, which he turned down due to his schedule. Donner knew Mel was a rising star. He had come to everyone's attention in the Mad Max trilogy. Shane at first was a bit unsure that Mel could do the part justice, but quickly changed his mind when he saw Mel come in to read for the role. For Riggs' background, he is a former Special Forces soldier who lost his wife in a car accident three years prior and has turned suicidal. Gibson was impressed with the story, saying it was a cut above others he had passed on. Because the action is really a sideline which heightens the story of the characters Riggs and Murtar, Mel said he pictured Riggs as an almost Chaplin-esque figure, a guy who doesn't expect anything from life and even toys with the idea of taking his own. He's somebody he doesn't look like he's set to go off until he actually does. Given Roger Murtar had no set ethnicity in the script, Glover once reading it felt the role of Murtar offered a whole new range of character expression and experience. One of the reasons he jumped at this project was the family aspect. Glover said Murtar's a little cranky about his age until everything he loves is threatened. His reawakening parallels Riggs. The casting director suggested teaming Gibson with Danny Glover. She arranged for Gibson and Glover to meet and read through the script together to see how their chemistry worked. According to Richard Donner, they found innuendos, they found laughter where they never saw it, and most importantly, they found a relationship, all in just one reading. Donner said it was magical and dynamite. For the other cast of characters, we have Gary Boosie as Mr. Joshua. Gary had not auditioned for a film in years, but wanted to to have the opportunity to work with Dick, Joe, Mel and Danny. He said he was constantly looking for someone to pull the best performance out of him. Boosie says he was hired to play Joshua because they were looking for someone big and menacing, enough to be a believable foe for Mel Gibson. Gary Boosie also credits the film for reviving his failing film career. Veteran actor Mitchell Ryan plays Peter McAllister, the head of the Special Forces team who have reformed after the Vietnam War. Mitchell was a star of stage and screen. After Lethal Weapon, he popped up in Hot Shots Part 2, Jaws Dread, Halloween The Curse of Michael Myers, Liar Liar and Gross Point Blank. Tom Atkins plays Michael Hunsaker, who runs a bank and is laundering money for Peter McAllister and wants out of the business and has close ties to Roger Murtagh. I'm sure some of you will recognise Tom from John Carpenter's The Fog, Escape from New York and Halloween 3. Darlene Love plays Trisha Murtagh. She was a successful singer before moving into acting. She didn't really take on that many film roles, but would reprise her role for the sequels. Tracy Wolf plays Rihanna, the oldest of Murtagh's children. She gets kidnapped by Mr. Joshua. Surprisingly, Tracy didn't really act much outside of the Lethal Weapon series and appears to have retired. We have a number of familiar faces for the supporting roles. We have Steve Kahn as Captain Murphy. Steve is Richard Donner's cousin. He appeared in Superman the movie playing a police officer and also popped up in Predator 2 with Danny Glover and Gary Boosie. Shared universe. Mary Ellen Trainer plays Dr. Stephanie Woods. She warns Captain Murphy of Riggs' mental state and she returned for the sequels for more comedic moments as Riggs likes to embarrass her and mess her around. Mary also appeared in Richard Donner's The Goonies, Die Hard, Action Jackson, Ricochet and many other classic films. She sadly passed away in 2015. We have Ed O'Ross as Mendez, who is another shady drug dealer wanting to get his supplies from Peter McAllister. Ed Ross became a familiar face of action movies such as Red Heat, Full Metal Jacket and also played Itchy and Dick Tracy. And last but not least we have Grand L. Bush as Boyett, who works in Murtagh's department. He returned for the sequel but also popped up in Die Hard and played Balrog in Street Fighter the movie. Once all the actors were in place, filming started in early August of 1986 in and around LA. To familiarise the actors with the specialised skills acquired by undercover cops, 
Arrangements were made for Gibson and Glover to spend time in the field accompanying working LAPD officers. Throughout filming, technical advisors from the LAPD as well as the LA County Sheriff's Department worked closely with Donna and the actors to ensure authenticity. Interestingly, they used Richard Donner's own house for the drug bust, as we see Riggs and Murtagh take out the guy and fall into the pool. The film opens with a girl appearing to commit suicide. LAPD homicide sergeant Roger Murtagh is sent to investigate and discovers the girl is the daughter of his old friend Michael Hunsacker. The lab reports find that she didn't commit suicide but was poisoned. Murtar is then informed he's being partnered up with another sergeant who's being transferred to his department. Murtar is aware of Riggs' problems but takes note of his high skill set as a top marksman and his skills as a martial artist. Murtar pays a visit to Hunsucker to inform him of their findings. Michael tells Roger that he was concerned about his daughter Amanda's involvement in drugs and prostitution and was trying to get Roger to help her escape that life and tells him he needs to find the people who did this to his daughter and kill them for him declaring that Roger owes him as he saved his life back in Vietnam. Murtagh and Riggs attempt to question Amanda's pimp and stumble across people dealing coke, which leads to a shootout. Even though the case seems closed, Riggs is aware that the only witness to Amanda's appeared suicide was Dixie, another prostitute. They head to Dixie's house to question her, but it explodes as they approach. After the fire is put out, Riggs finds part of a mercury switch from the bomb's debris, indicating a professional had set the bomb. Some children nearby had witnessed a man approaching the house with a tattoo similar to Riggs, indicating it's someone with a military background. Roger suspects his friend Michael hasn't told him the full story. Michael is questioned by Roger before his daughter's funeral where he reveals that he was previously part of a shadow company during the war headed by General Peter McAllister and his chief enforcer Mr Joshua. They smuggled out heroin but once the war was over they parted ways but reformed to continue their drug operations. Hunsaka had been laundering the money but wanted to get out. The general knows Michael has spoken with Roger and Mr Joshua takes out Michael. Riggs and Murtagh now have to form a plan to stop these guys before any more lives are put at risk. In 2000, Warner Brothers put out a director's cut of the film. I read some reports online saying it's not really a director's cut and more of a marketing tool, as later versions of the film on Blu-ray, for example, just restored the theatrical cut and these extra scenes are now included as deleted scenes, with some additional footage that didn't make the finished film. In this director's cut, we see Riggs losing his temper and smashes his TV with a beer bottle. Later he buys a new one and is welcomed home by his dog who is happy to see him. We see Murtagh before partnering with Riggs going to the firing range to practice. Riggs before the dope shootout at the Christmas tree sale, answers a call in a schoolyard with a sniper. Riggs walks out in the line of fire and kills the shooter. This is done to really enforce that Riggs has no fear of death. Riggs after leaving Murtagh's house goes out to solicit a prostitute and pays her $100 to watch the Three Stooges with him. That was about it really for this new version in 2000. The majority of the other deleted scenes are additional moments of dialogue trimmed from existing scenes, for example Murtagh interacting with his kids, winding up his daughter for spending too much money on boots, Riggs chatting with a jumper, a slightly longer scene with a fight in the pool, we see Joshua surprising Rihanna and her boyfriend as he kidnaps her, and Riggs chats with Murtagh's youngest child to reassure her that he and Roger will bring Rihanna home safely. As with all deleted scenes, it's often very obvious that these moments are cut for pacing issues and also they don't really further add much to the film as other scenes have demonstrated certain character traits or have given us enough information already. Sometimes you discover great moments that leave you baffled while they cut out a certain scene, but in the case of Lethal Weapon, the theatrical cut is a tight and efficient edit that works perfectly. Michael Kamen and Eric Clapton handled the score to Lethal Weapon, with contributions from David Sanborn. By 1987, Kamen felt his career would have taken off, but many of the movies he scored hadn't done well at the box office, such as Brazil, Life Force and Highlander. All incredible scores, but he felt directors only noticed you if you were involved in a hit movie. Luckily, editor Stuart Baird tempted the film with Kamen's and Clapton's work on the hit BBC show Edge of Darkness, which would later have a movie produced in 2010, directed by Martin Campbell and starring Mel Gibson. Stewart found the music for the BBC show fascinating and thought it sounded original. Richard Donner at the time didn't know where to go with the music and liked what Stewart had used. So Stewart arranged an interview with Dick Donner, Joel Silver and Michael Kamen. Dick Donner got on really well with Kamen, but Kamen initially turned down the composing duties as he felt the movie wasn't for him. He wasn't a fan of the action genre, despite going on to do the scores to the first three Die Hard movies, License to Kill, Roadhouse and Last Action Hero. 
Michael Kamen couldn't discount Stewart's idea of having the guitar music to represent Mel Gibson and the saxophone for Danny Glover. He thought it was a brilliant idea and made it easy for him to figure out the logistics of the score, so he agreed to take the job, but also another driving factor for his decision was Shane Black's script, which he felt was the first time that the action was motivated by characters and the relationships between them. Eric Clapton performed the guitar themes and David Sanborn performed the saxophone part. Michael Kamen would handle dramatic and action moments with a 98-piece orchestra. The film also had a music video produced featuring the band Honeymoon Suite titled Lethal Weapon. The song was featured during the end credits, but surprisingly they aren't credited. For a composer who is not a fan of the action genre, he became such a master of it. When you hear those guitar and saxophone cues throughout the score, you know instantly it's Lethal Weapon. The saxophone themes are a tad cheesy, and often it could be confused with softcore porn music, but it fits so well with the style and the story. Once the film was a hit, many other movies had a similar style of score. Even Brad Fidel followed suit with the Bruce Willis action film Striking Distance. The best stuff for me is the emotional moments with Riggs. Eric Clapton's guitarists come into play and really heighten those emotions, and I don't think any other approach would have worked for the character. There was also a lot of experimental sounds and even synthesizers used for the bad guys, so there is a great mix of musical styles thrown into the music that makes it stand out from the rest. Michael brought a lot of originality to the music and didn't just provide a standard action score. The soundtrack came out when the film was released arriving on cassette and CD, featuring 10 tracks of music. There was a reissue in 2002 with 3,000 copies printed, and the score was expanded by seven additional tracks of unreleased music. In December 2013, La La Land Records released the complete score as part of the Lethal Weapon soundtrack collection, further expanding the tracks from 17 to 26 with alternative cues that didn't make the final cut. This epic box set contains eight CDs and is still available to purchase, but it's not cheap costing in the region of $120. There was a lot of great music there, so it's worth getting if you have the cash, and if you are a fan of Michael Kamen and Eric Clapton's work. The one thing I'm sure all Lethal Weapon fans want is John Eric Alexander's music from the trailer, one of the most fondly remembered pieces of music associated with the film that did get briefly used in Hot Fuzz, but never got an official release, sadly. Lethal Weapon is one of the handful of movies from the 80s that everyone remembers. Whenever a top 10 list or TV program discussing movies of that decade, Lethal Weapon is always mentioned alongside Back to the Future, Ghostbusters and Die Hard. It's earned its place among the rest to be remembered as an important movie for many people growing up. It's a film that gave the buddy cop genre a new lick of paint and introduced us to two characters that we would be invested in and would follow on for three more sequels. Getting the formula right is always tough and balancing the tone. Lethal Weapon could have fallen into obscurity and just been seen as another throwaway action film. But Gibson's and Glover's chemistry and performance just make audiences want more. These were flawed characters that people could relate to. They weren't super invincible muscle men, they were seen as real people with real problems. For me, the series has always been something I've been aware of since I was a child. The first movie in particular was always on TV, often late at night because of its violence, but I would make an effort to stay up and watch it when I could. Lethal Weapon 2 I have stronger memories of as it came out in 1989, and being seven years old, I was far more aware of things around me and knew that the sequel was extremely popular. But because I didn't get a chance to take the film as a kid, and certainly my dad wasn't going to rent it for me, the series kind of drifted away from me and I didn't return to the series until part 4 came out in the late 90s. Of course we had Lethal Weapon 3 during that time frame, but my interest had kind of shifted and catching up with the franchise at a later date was how I got back into it. When you think of Richard Donner in terms of pop culture, he is probably remembered for directing Superman and The Goonies, two extremely popular movies with children and adults, and both have strong fan bases to this day, probably more so with Superman. In the case of Lethal Weapon, he directed all four movies, and those kind of defined him as this action director. He has openly said he is not a huge fan of the action genre, and finds the characters within those movies more interesting than filming another shootout or explosion. Having that desire to focus on the characters made this series so successful with critics and audiences. All action movies need is a great villain, and thankfully they got Gary Busey to play the part. He became this go-to guy for villains for a short spell. He has that crazy look in his eyes and looks like he can look after himself, despite not being this muscle-bound hard man. He is very controlled with his performance very early on, making him this intimidating and great foe for Riggs. For the most part, Richard Donner shot a lot of his features in the Cinemascope format, but for Lethal Weapon 1, he goes with a ratio of 185 to 1. Come the sequels, he returns to the wider aspect ratio, 
I'm guessing to capture the action, which ramps up to be more explosive and bigger in scale, which is often the case with sequels, things have to be bigger and better. In the case of the first movie, with that tighter frame it makes it more of an intimate picture. He wants us to get close to Martin and Roger so we understand their problems, and with a relatively small cast of characters, these choice of lenses work with the story. Riggs's poor mental state is played out very early on into the movie. The scene where he gets so close to committing suicide is very moving, and one of the most important scenes in the franchise. He has nothing left to live for, he is not afraid of death, and that's what makes him dangerous and unpredictable. He makes the right decision not to go through with it. The film lays it out straight away that Riggs is coming to the end, so to speak. But what saves him is teaming up with Roger, having that new partner who is willing to work with him and lets him into his family and made to feel welcome, really makes a huge difference for Riggs. And come the end he has straightened out his problems and realises there is something worth living for. The film deals with dark themes and it isn't just another action movie with the heroes just saving the day or busting crime with ease. It has a strong slice of drama and sets the tone. Thankfully the film isn't all doom and gloom and Richard Donner helped push the comedy. When you have depressing or dark themes you have to balance it out with something light hearted and Lethal Weapon is full of that. It never tips over into being a straight out serious crime thriller. It pulls it back to be a fun action movie with flourishes of great humour and witty dialogue which is a Shane Black trait. Richard Donner always had a good eye to capture action scenes. Things are well staged and covered, with his go-to guy for editing Stuart Baird, who he had worked with on The Omen, Superman and Ladyhawk. They deliver really dynamic scenes and they are cut in a very contemporary way. The famous chase through the streets in downtown LA is intense, as Riggs is resorted to running at top speed to chase after Joshua, which results in a one-on-one -on -one fight outside Roger's house. Riggs just wants to take him down himself, and the police stand back to let him do it and in some way this scene lets Riggs get his demons out and puts his past to rest. The end fight however is a bit problematic, with the choice in lenses and the direction to shoot the first part of it in close ups, you end up struggling to see what's going on. This is often the case when you have actors who haven't been in that many fight scenes before, or aren't experts in martial arts. Mel's fighting technique is not the best on camera when it comes to showcasing some skills in that fighting style, but the fight is very intense and because we've been on this journey and what Joshua and his team have done, you are right behind Riggs and you want him to win. It's interesting come Christmas people often like to declare what they're going to watch at Christmas and Die Hard most often makes the list, but Lethal Weapon is also set at Christmas and rarely gets that Christmas love so to speak. Well, this is only from what I've noticed on social media and my circle of friends. The majority of Shane Black's scripts are set at Christmas, but this festive celebration is always in the background. It's never really front and centre, so it's not a Christmas movie in a traditional sense. When you look at the release dates for Lethal Weapon and Die Hard, they weren't given Christmas releases and both hit screens in the USA during the summer. Over time, and often how these movies are played on TV during Christmas time, it then becomes part of that yearly celebration, and you just automatically put them in the camp of Christmas movies, which is great. I would say, however, that Die Hard is probably more of a Christmas film, as it's set on Christmas Eve, and also takes place on one day, whereas Lethal Weapon is set over a number of days, and I think makes less attempts to highlight that it is Christmas. When it comes to buddy cop movies, Lethal Weapon is the gold standard. There is of course other great movies such as 48 Hours, Bad Boys, Rush Hour and of course Shane Black's recent buddy cop movie, the highly underrated The Nice Guys, which was my favourite film of 2016. Lethal Weapon comes out on top because you have that dramatic edge to it. The others play more on the comedy side. Lethal Weapon of course has comedic moments, but the lead characters are more emotional and vulnerable, and these heroes seem more human and relatable. It just balances everything perfectly, and that is the skill of Richard Donner. That's what made him such a versatile and great director. He could tackle any genre, and that's what made him one of Warner Brothers' go-to guys. Lethal Weapon has aged very well. It's of course very 80s, Gibson is rocking a fabulous mullet, but everything else still seems very fresh with its themes and direction. It doesn't feel like a 30-year-old film. If you haven't seen it before or in years, go watch it as soon as you can and I guarantee you'll be aching to watch the sequels straight afterwards because you just want to see Riggs and Murtar again doing what they do best. I got you. I got you, partner. Hunsacker spoke to the police, sir. Are they dead? No, sir, I missed the opportunity. Very disappointing. So the police may know everything, the whole operation. That is correct, sir. Joshua, I think it's time we turned up the heat. A 
sister's got my daughter. Murto. You have a very beautiful daughter. And if I were you, I'd stick by the phone to find out where to meet us. You know they're gonna kill her, don't you? And if you want her back, you're gonna have to take her away from them. We do this my way. You shoot, you shoot to kill. Get as many as you can. All you gotta do is just not miss. I won't miss. We're gonna get bloody on this one, Roger. Thank <laughs> you.